Human beings are compounded of opposites. We have the constructive side of us that tries to create. We have the destructive side of us that's drawn toward death and destruction. And we have to keep fighting this conflict in us to be creative when the destructive side is always lurking around, ready to destroy us. Why do I love actors? Because of all the people in the world that I have met as a group of people, they are the most open, the most tolerant, the least bigoted, the most imaginative, the most willing to take risks, and the least conventional. The emotion of relationship to the place is more important than the physical place itself. You must create a place that you are familiar with, that is yours. And you must, if it's your home, make sure that you use it the way you use your home. If it's a place you've never been to before, use curiosity about somebody else's house even though it's your own room that you're using, find things in it to discover. The reason is most readings take place in an office or on a bare stage. And it's a, a great disadvantage to you because it takes belief away from you and it makes you worry about stagehands and, and auditors and everybody else. But if, if the place is strong, you are grounded in a reality in which you believe. Don't waste time becoming set designers. Use locations, rooms you know. You know how it is when you come home from work? You put the key in the door and you open and you think, nothing to do tonight, I'm lonely, I hate this place. Another night you come home, you open the door and you close it behind you and think, Thank God I don't have to see anybody. I'm in heaven. I'm a, my own place. Same place, different emotional relationship to it. There are time, I own a house. I have times when I hate that house. It's nothing but one headache after another. And days in which I think, aren't I lucky to have this house to, to live in? So it's how you feel about the place at this given moment that is important, not just the physicality of the place. In other words, it's your relationship to the place and how you have the other person relate to the place. You know how if you go to most places and you sit down in the chair that the person who owns the place is used to sitting in, how they, they will, sometimes they will say, would you mind sitting over here? Or, or they will get fidget and carry on. And you think, what's wrong with them? What's wrong with them? Just because you're in their chair. So... All of those things are extremely useful to ground you and give you a reality instead of a feeling of a bare office or a bare space. Oh. By yonder blessed moon, I swear, the tips with silver all these fruit tree tops. Oh, swear not by the moon, the inconstant moon that monthly changes her circled orb, lest thy love prove likewise variable. What shall I swear by? Do not swear at all. Or if thou wilt, swear by thy gracious self, which is the god of my idolatry, and I'll believe thee. If my heart's dear love 
Do not swear then. John? Um, I, I, I was falling in love with everyone beside me. <laughs> uh, That's not like you, John. <laughs> Watch yourself. No, just, just right from the start, uh, Laura, you on, you're on stage and it was just roses and, and, and love pouring out of you and then the, the two of you coming together and, and your spirits mixing in, and, you know, when you're committed that much to your partner, everything takes care of itself. <clears throat> Anna Cry. It was, it was just really, really beautiful. It was fragile, it was so delicate that it was, you, you didn't want to, it was like, you felt as though somebody in the audience could disrupt this, this, this thing that was just so soft, but the concentration was just, between the two of you, the magnetism, it, it didn't matter whether one was on stage and one wasn't, because you felt the other's presence no matter where the other was. And it was just, that was what struck me, was just the, how delicate and incredibly fragile it was. It was wonderful. So how did you get to this glorious point? <laughs> I think it was dinner at my parents' no, place last night. Did it. <laughs> it really did. <laughs> what did it? Oh, I don't know. We did, we did some great improvs. And last, yesterday, we were lovers in the park all afternoon. And we were right near where my, my, uh, well, <laughs> not literally. <laughs> no, but you know That's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, we went to my parents' house because it was 10 minutes away and uh, they fed us. <laughs> and uh, I thought it, it would be a great future improv, you know. But we didn't have to do We didn't have we got, to do we anything. We went to her parents' place and I felt like a boyfriend being brought home for the first time. Yep. Because we'd established a relationship through rehearsal and improvs. So, and we didn't even talk about, like, we didn't expect that to happen. Yeah. I showed up at the door and they, they were, of course, expecting Laura's boyfriend. And, uh, well, who's this chap? And he's playing Romeo, okay. Then I, the next thing I know, I'm in the living room with the grandparents and the father and the mother. <laughs> and they're all kind of staring at me. And... Game playing and role playing does not mean insincere. We are playing a game today of going to a class. I am playing the role of instructor. You are playing the role of actor-student. If we meet at a cocktail party, our relationship will change entirely. We will be competing for who is the sexiest, who is the wittiest, and who can get the most people at the cocktail party to turn on to us. You'll win. But, it's the same people. When David Merritt calls me in to cast a show, it's, what is it you wish, Mr. Merrick? And Toby? You don't get this fellow that sits here. You get a whole different performance. It's the adjustment we make to the needs of that relationship that determines the role we play in that game. Everything we do is a game. The game of driving, the game of cooking, the game of making love, the game of friendship. Everything is a game. So don't think of it as insincere. It's just that life is one series of games after another. And we must adjust our roles to fit the game. And you know how people will say to us, you're not playing fair? Well, they're saying, you're not following the rules of the game. Actors must become very conscious of it and make very specific choices about what game are we in and what role am I playing in this game. This is no time for wearing the shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. I am glad to say I have never seen a spade. It is obvious that our social circles have been widely different. <laughs> Shall I lay the tea here as usual, madam? Yes, as usual. Many interesting walks in the vicinity, Miss Cardew. 
Oh, yes, a great many. From the top of one of the hills quite close, one can see five counties. Five counties? I don't think I should like that. I don't like crowds. I suppose that is why you live in town? <laughs> Quite a well-kept garden this is, Miss Cardew. So glad you like it, Miss Fairfax. I had no idea there were any flowers in the country. Oh, no. Flowers are as common here, Miss Fairfax, as people are in London. What do you think the play is about? What do you think it's about? The play is about games people play and how much they enjoy them. That's the very relationships true. Relationships that they enjoy. Yeah. Enjoy now, but, but much more specific, please. What games? It's all manners. It's none of its real feelings. It's just... Of course there well, are real feelings. It's real feelings. That's, That's the kind I mean. of judgment that makes for bad acting. I, well, I didn't mean there's not there's real, not real feelings involved. Yes, you did. You said so. Yeah, but... Trying to cover I, up yeah, thanks, what you really feel. Thanks, thanks for the help, Gail. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Gail. <laughs> I knew what she meant. <laughs> she knew what I meant. Now, it's more specific. You're, you're absolutely right, but let's get more specific. What is it about? What are the games about? It's not saying what you really feel. It's saying what you think you need to say to get what you want. Language is very important to these people. Who says what, what way? But it is all based on perversity. Perversity and real estate. This is a play about real estate. Now, you see, I wouldn't guess that. I would not. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think about it, aren't all the arguments about where people live? What part, even if you live on the correct block, do you live in the correct house? And if you live in the country, my God, compared to the city, it's all about real estate. And so is modern life. It's certainly in New York City. So, um, and perversity. I'm happy to say it's on the increase. <laughs> <laughs> Due largely to the effect of this play and the sexual revolution. <laughs> Mischievousness is causing trouble just for the hell of it. Because you get a kick out of it. Whole careers have been built on mischievousness. Greta Garbo, Marlene Dietrich, Lena Horn. And all three of them have mischievousness by the bucket. And here they are, these glamorous, beautiful creatures, seductive and mysterious and everything, but filled with mischief. If you, if you go, if you rent any Garbo film, you will be just amazed at the mischievousness of that woman. In the midst of the most romantic love scene, she does the most mischievous thing and will laugh at the absurdity of this whole thing. In Camille, where she's dying of consumption, she gets humor and mischievousness into it. It's just phenomenal acting. I think she's the greatest screen actress we've ever had. One time, I went to an opening of a friend of mine's play, Arthur Lawrence, and I opened a play called A Clearing in the Woods at the Belasco Theater in New York. And the Belasco Theater has no lobby, so you have to go out on the street for the intermission cigarette. On an opening night, of course, you wouldn't be caught dead in your seat. You have to go out in the street. So you see who's there, and they see who that you are there. And so we're all crowded out in the street, and it's about 20 below zero. And standing over there, dressed in pale tangerine chiffon, with nothing underneath whatsoever, with the rest of us huddled in our fur coats, was Marlene Dietrich standing there as if she were in the Garden of Allah or on a desert island. And everybody was watching her because here was a matter of absolute triumph of mind over matter. She was not cold. She had decided she wasn't going to be cold. They were going to see this dress and this figure underneath this dress. And it was an absolute 
wonderful example of mischievousness to me. And I watched, she couldn't help it. She was trying to have a conversation with them, but little, little smiles would come up here because she was so amused at everybody else going, oh my God, she's absolutely stuck naked out in this cold and we can hardly stand here. Mystery and secret is very, very, very difficult to give you a concept of. If you just get some idea of what I mean, I can show you. Uh, mystery is, after you have done all the 13 guideposts, add what you do not know in terms of curiosity about the other person. What is going on with you? Why are you doing that? Why are you looking at me like that? Something's going on, I can tell. And what were you laughing at? But something mysterious is going on in your head behind all that, isn't there? Do you see how it increases relationship? There is one of the things that actors have to bring back into the world is curiosity. We live in a society in which everybody, so anxious to be sophisticated and in the know, knows everything. And what they don't know, they refuse to admit they don't know. So they don't find out new things. So they don't have the curiosity. As I told you earlier, I've kept the curiosity of a child. And if you have given that up, learn to develop it again. Curiosity is the most rewarding thing, because I am curious from morning to night about everything, so I have never spent a boring moment in my life. Irritating moments, but not boring. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, develop curiosity. Now be curious, of, uh, for instance, somebody will do something absolutely bizarre on stage, and I think, what in the world they do that for? And the other person isn't the least curious, and I think, What's the matter with that person up there? Why aren't they curious? That, you must leave yourself open to add whatever is happening in addition to whatever you rehearsed or plan, so that it has this freshness of using what is going on in addition to what you have planned and rehearsed. And don't forget, three improvs to one, one run through. Improvs are most important. And I'll show you more improvs on Monday. One of the most important improvs to do is animal improvs. It's the one you should begin with. Like uh, a, a German and a, a German Shepherd and a um, wirehead terrier and cheese and heat. and what kind of love making you do and rolling around on the floor and so forth. Just walk into the house of your partner and start in doing that. It breaks the ice at once. What sort of um, ideas or recommendations or whatever do you have for... Uh, getting over shyness. Two yeah, getting over shyness with two people. I just told you. Yeah, you but... Just, to take chances. Chances. just do it. Just do it. Just come in and start doing it. Don't talk. Mm -hmm. Discussion leads nowhere. Do. Do, do, do. Now, one other thing. When a partner says, I need this from you in this scene, you must do this for me so I can do this. Say, I will do that. But we must do trade-offs. If I do that for you, you owe me one when I need it from you. <laughs> and that is the way to get along with your partner. If they ask you to do something, instead of saying, stop directing me and, full, and gathering injustices and feeling injured and coming to me and saying, my partner's overwhelming me and directing me, just say, I will do this for you, but you do owe, one, owe, owe me one. Then you get yours back and then say, now you may have another one. <laughs> if they give you five, you say, you owe me five. <laughs> so if you do this exchange all the time, it's the best way to get along. You don't have to like each other to do this. <laughs> don't expect to like all your partners. You probably hate half of them. And um, 
half of them will try and direct you. So you just say to them, all right, I'll do this for you, then you got to do this for me. And if you keep that fair exchange, it usually works out best. Uh, so, mystery, clear? It's exploring the mystery and the other person, and also the mystery in yourself. Why am I doing this? Why did I say that? I've never done this before. What is happening to me? Why is this person having this effect on me? So explore the mystery of what is going on in this relationship. Oh, the mystery of yourself. What am I doing in this situation? What is this person doing to me? Why am I here? What, what is all this about? Do I need this? Do I want this? Yes, I do. Why is she making it so difficult for me? Then explore the mystery of the other person. What are you up to? Why are you acting so strangely? What is all this? You're hiding something. You're not hiding something. Yes, you are. I think you are. You're up to something. I know you are. So you keep exploring the mystery, because every other human being is a mystery to us, right? So there's always mystery to find, to explore in another human being. As they, all they have to do is have one strange look on their face. Um, And you think, what does that mean? So use this mystery and curiosity about what the other person is doing and about what you're doing and about what's going on. Add that to it. Secret. There are three kinds of secrets. There's the secret that you have, that you want the other person to know you have, so they will ask you what it is so that you can tell it. There is a secret where you want the other person to know what it is, to know that you have a secret, so that you will refuse to tell them what it is. The third one is a secret you have that you don't want anyone to know about, and you would deny it if anyone asked you, such as incest. So, any one of those three secrets. The most valuable one is the secret that you have, that you want someone to ask so that you can tell what it is. But the other two will also <coughs> can be very effective in certain scenes. Have you got something in your eye? Oh, it's nothing. No. It's nothing. It's just a speck of dust. It'll be gone in a minute. Oh, my sleeve must have brushed against you. Sit down. Let me look at it. you hold still? Well, I do believe you're trembling. Big, strong man though you are. Ooh, Miss what Julie. muscles. Miss Julie. Ooh. Yes, Monsieur Jean? Je ne suis ton homme. Stay still. There, now it's out. Kiss my hand and say thank you. Miss Julie, listen. Kristen's gone to bed now. Will you listen? Kiss my hand first. Very well. But you'll only have yourself to blame. What, Tam Tamara or Tamara? Tamara. Tamara. Tamara had a wonderful sense of mischief, didn't she? Mm -hmm. Now, this is the quality <laughs> that she has that she used wonderfully in the scene. And it's one of the things that you must cultivate in yourselves, because you all have it, because it's, it's what appeals to us enormously. Jack Nicholson has a whole lifelong career based on just being mischievous all the time. <laughs> What's the part of the body that gets turned on the most? <laughs> Good, down here. Yes. Why does everyone act above the waist? What's wrong with the crotch? Nothing. Well, why didn't you use it? Oh, God, I don't know. I didn't even think about it. What is the action of wanting to sleep with her? Of wanting to sleep with her? Yeah. What's the action of that? Undo my shirt. I kiss her. <laughs> or I try to kiss her. Um, so all these are ways to try and turn around, right? The, the, yeah. the illustration that I use we is that we, are, we, are all, we do things for, out of responsibilities to relationships, right? 
If somebody else needs something, or we need something from them, we do it. Yeah. We don't wait to feel it. So it was like I wasn't giving her enough to get what I wanted in return, because if I no. really would have given her more, whatever, she yeah. would probably give me yeah. more or whack me yeah. in the head or yeah. whatever. You know, like, and you, the same fall. way. And You're just dying to fall. turn around. Why don't you throw it on the floor and start in and then think, oh my God, what if that man walks in, I'll yeah. lose my job, yeah. and then stop. Then we have a scene. Yeah. But this way we have people just circling around each other. You've got to do it and then regret it, and then you have the opposites. But if you don't do it, what's to regret? And we don't want scenes that are all going to happen in the future. We want them to happen now. Every single time you get up, it should be now, now, now. That's the only chance you have is now. Well, what you're fighting for is, is to sleep with to her. To sleep with her. Right. Why do you want to sleep with her? Because I love her. I really like her. I'm blown away by her. OK. All right. Then why, why did you spend most of the scene running away from her? For instance, yeah, when, 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 she, when she came over here and, and soon, yeah. and, and, you know, and, and, and started to do this mm -hmm. to you, I thought you were at a, a massage parlor. I mean, a legitimate one. <laughs> Why did nothing happen to you? Well, my first impulse was to get up and go, actually. Why? Um, it's what you want. Because there's people, there's a whole party going on outside, and they might walk in the door any moment. And then and I... what do you want them to see? I don't want them to see, actually. Why? Because if the Count founds out that we've been doing this, I'm gone. I'm history. Historia. Adios. Bye-bye. Gonzo. I never see her yeah, again. And, and which impulse is strongest? Uh, to keep your job or to make love to her? No. To sleep with her. But I didn't get up. I stayed in the chair and I started rubbing her hand. And then I started going up and then she left. <laughs> Didn't I? Didn't I? You did, you did hold my hand. I His started caressing your hand. I was awfully pleased that you held her hand. <laughs> I thought nothing was ever going to happen. Uh, Michael said something early on in the course that uh, he said, um, you've got to think of yourself as a troop of clowns and uh, go up there and make an ass of yourself and stop taking yourself so seriously, basically. That helped a lot.